Welcome to While You're Reforging, an Age of Sigmar podcast where we talk about lore, hobby, tactics, and more. My name is Doug with the YouTube channel 2 Plus Stuff, and this show is brought to you by my patrons over on Patreon. So if you'd like even more Age of Sigmar content and to support the show, head over to YouTube. Sit down, grab your paints, and let's start the reforging. So today we have a fun episode. I'm going to clarify a few announcements that I made regarding the show at the top of it. And then going into uh, my, my main topic for the day is kind of the public perception of Fire Slayers and Carriage and Overlords, really any faction that doesn't have uh, native magic use in the new edition, which focuses very heavily on magic, uh, magic users, things like that with malign sorcery. So that's going to be the main topic for today's show. We'll also talk about the news and releases coming out from Games Workshop this coming week. It is Thursday as the time of recording, so I can talk about what's coming out this weekend. As well as dig into, uh, like I said, hobby progress and listener mail. There are quite a few questions. If you do have questions, when we get to that section, I will tell you how to leave them for me. So as I said, I want to start off the show talking about a few announcements. A lot of questions came up when I announced that I was doing this show. And I just kind of want to hit those head on and kind of set a precedent for the rest of really the podcast life. And that is to say that this is going to be uh, very regular. Uh, it's, it's so much easier for me in my current home and setup to really bust out the microphone and just kind of chat while I paint right now. I'll talk about what I'm painting here in a minute, but just doing some hobby and uh, kind of sharing that with you guys. The reason I'm not doing it live is because really I don't want to set up all of the, the lights and things like that, but this is so much easier for me and I really, really do like it. Uh, in addition to that, I tried to have a regular show, like a lore series out today on Friday, but I just I have been feeling pretty terrible this last week. Allergies are kicking my tail and so... The prospect of getting all the lights and stuff set up, it just it seemed daunting. And uh, this is really the whole reason this show exists is because it's so much easier. So I thought, well, let's lean into that and really just dive into there. Now, some of the questions that came up were, am I still going to do live shows on YouTube? Absolutely. If you want to know when I'm going to go live, head over to my Facebook page or Instagram. Uh, whenever, that's all the links below. Whenever I am going to go live that day, I'll put out a message, uh, part of my storyline and Instagram and uh, an announcement on my Facebook page just saying, hey, I'm going to go live. I give you my local time as well as the time that I'm going to be uh, going live. So I'll say usually it's about 6 to 6.30 uh, Pacific Standard Time here in the U.S., which is the Seattle area, which is where I am located at. Um, so people were worried that I was going to stop doing live stuff because it's a little more interactive, and I do appreciate that. But I notice that when I do live shows, I don't tend to stick to a topic very long. I get kind of bogged down in uh, just saying hi to people because that's what really live things are about is interaction with the community uh, rather than just kind of straightforward content. If uh, you would like to get AOS content five days a week, this is another question that came from somebody, uh, I need I need some support over on Patreon. Uh, basically what happened was last month I did five videos a week for a month and I did it for a specific reason. That's seeing how much, frankly, uh, ad revenue I can make with that and then seeing if I could take a day off work without losing much money. By that I mean, does the money I made from that month compensate if I were to go to four days a week at my current job, which is an option. And so people were like, oh, you sped up for a second and then you slowed way down. Well, that's because I was testing to see if it's possible really to just be supported by you, the community, and, and just really serve you by doing a lot more content. And it is. So if you would like AOS stuff five days a week, uh, visit me on Patreon. I don't need much more support to make that happen. Uh, it's my next goal. Uh, and if so, if that's something you'd like, with that, I would guarantee that I have a video out, a podcast out every week, and then videos five days a week for you. So a lot of content to consume. Um, if that's something that interests you, uh, somebody had asked about what, what that money goes to, and that's exactly what it's for. So that's kind of my main announcements of questions that people have been asking me about the podcast since it's released. And so let's dig into some hobby progress. So I'm sitting right here with a small mountain of fire slayers in front of me. And I'm actually having a great time painting these dudes. They're a lot of fun. They're very straightforward. It's one of those models that like, or I'm sorry, I should say, I should say model lines really because they're all fundamentally the same where it's really just one thing you have to learn to do well and the rest of it falls in place. So if you learn skin and, and the beards, if you settle on a scheme for those, these guys paint very, very quickly, and I am loving it. Uh, kind of give you an idea of where I'm at. This is like three days since I last recorded, and so I uh, haven't had a ton more done. I actually finished up 10 Volkite Berserkers, 
because uh, I was like halfway through those when we stopped the last cast. And so I finished those up pretty quickly. Once you get past the skin, you just kind of do the, the armor and stuff really, really quickly. Touch it up a bit and then uh, dive right into the beard, which really honestly is the standout piece. If you do the beard well, you can get away with a lot of mistakes on everything else on these guys. Just by virtue of how much room it takes up on the front of them. Uh, so I finished 10 full kite berserkers. Uh, no heroes, but basically I... If you're not if you're not familiar, if you weren't keeping up, I cleared out a 40k army that I had sitting around because I really am not enjoying 40k really whatsoever lately. Uh, it's just the list building aspect of it. It's not fun for me. Uh, and the command point thing, it just none of it seems very enticing to me. But I'm loving the AOS stuff, and so uh, my main army is Slaves to Darkness. I wanted something to kind of challenge myself and play very differently, so I wanted a faction that had no magic. And so, uh, which is actually be very relevant to today's topic. So I wanted something that's very different, plays different, feels different, and looks different. I wanted a very bold color scheme for whatever I got next because my chaos is very black and white and, and steel. And so the um, Fire Slayers here use a lot of warm colors, a lot of brights. So I just thought that would be a lot of fun. Uh, so yeah, I got a good lot from a, a gentleman in the local area who had a used set. He he didn't put the, the most amount of work into building them, but they're they're good enough. Uh, and with that, I got 20 berserker, uh, Volkai Berserkers, I should say. Uh, five Hearthguard uh, Berserkers, five Auric Hearthguard. So that's the elite infantry with like uh, maces, basically. And then also elite infantry with kind of the spear guns that shoot magma. Uh, pretty far off to the side here. Basically, people tunnel those in and then shoot the enemy from behind, that kind of stuff. Really cool uh, thematic things like that. And so, they all then um, basically a star collecting box. So it's the sun on a magma droth uh, with, let's see, rune father on foot and rune smiter on foot. And um, really, uh, that's kind of my starting point. It, it, it does add up to be roughly a thousand point army, not an optimal start, but not bad at all. And so, uh, basically, I don't like to get bogged down with too many unbuilt kits. And so I decided, well, I'm going to paint these guys up before I really invest in anything else. Also, to make sure that I enjoy painting them. Because if I don't enjoy painting them, then all oh, this is really just for nothing. Because <laughs> uh, I, I do believe that. If, if you don't enjoy the creation of an army, you're not going to enjoy really anything else about it. But, uh, yeah, I've actually been loving it. I, I, I haven't played them on a tabletop yet, so I'm still... Uh, trying to learn what they're supposed to be doing from various online forums. The Fire Slayers community on Facebook has been absolutely superb in just offering a lot of advice and helpful tips. Uh, just kind of talking about what's worked in the past and how things have changed for them since the new edition. And honestly, not a lot has. The The biggest thing is that Volkite Berserkers, uh, their basic infantry guy, lost their uh, kind of big bonus for being a mega unit like some of the others have. Uh, and then that's really just a balancing issue because they're super good in large quantities. And so it just rewarded you for taking the size of unit that you were already always going to take. Um, again, some people were really upset about that. I have no personal opinion of it because I wasn't playing the army. You know, I didn't, I didn't have 90 berserkers sitting around uh, that are now possibly collecting dust. So I get it. Uh, people get hurt whenever additions change. And, and that's, that's just part of the gig. Um, but I have been enjoying... Uh, painting them up. If you haven't seen my paint scheme, uh, you can head over to Instagram and check it out. Really what it is, it's uh, your basic fire slayers. I have the red beards. Uh, Cadian flesh is kind of the main tone for the skin. It's, it's the mid-tone, the one that shows the most. And um, kept it simple with the flesh and then really went into the beard. I followed the tutorial that they had on Warmer TV from forever ago, like when the actual fire slayer book came out almost two, three and a half years now. Uh, where, uh, I don't remember her name, I think it was Emma on Warhammer TV. She was she was doing stuff with Duncan tutorials, painting tutorials, things like that. Uh, she did great. I actually even miss her as a, as a content producer, but uh, she did a Fire Slayers paint tutorial that had basically you do Jacaro orange on as a base for the hair and beard, like the actual like top hat thing they wear, plus the beard. Uh, give that a coat of Troll Slayer orange to make it nice and bright. A wash of whatever the orange uh, Games Workshop wash is. And then uh, kind of build up some various colors from there. Like I do Caraberg Crimson halfway through the beard. And then Nuln Oil at the very top where it meets the lips. Uh, same thing for the base of the Mohawk they have. 
And what that does is it kind of gives this nice vibrancy going from a very, very dark closer to the head to a very, very raging bright towards the ends, whether that's the bottom of the beard or the top of the mohawk. And from there, you do a dry brush of, I think it's Kindle Flame, whatever their, their like weird technical dry brush. I've never liked the dry brush uh, technical paints. Like the Necron Compound is one of them. I, I just, uh, they don't seem to, to come off my brush very easily. Uh, and onto the model. I have made more success dry brushing other colors, but not the actual technical dry brush paint. So kind of odd on that one, but um, Emma used it. So I went with it and uh, it has pretty good results. I, I do like it. Uh, the result is when you put that on, it kind of blends the, the, the three layers that you have. Cause at that point you have the, uh, the fire slayer orange with the wash, the orange wash on it. You have the caribou crimson layer and then also the null oil wash layer. When you put that dry brush on there, it makes a stark kind of layer that goes above all of them. And then I made a change from the Games Workshop tutorial. She used Lamenter's Yellow and just coated the whole mohawk and the whole beard in that. And what that does is it adds a strong yellow hint, or tint, I should say hint, uh, to the dry brush layer you put down. And it makes like this like very bright uh, tone that kind of brings all the other color layers together. And it really makes that orange that you laid down in the beginning really bright, like raging bright. And I absolutely love it. The change that I made was I actually just did another wash of the Cas I think it's Cascara yellow, the actual yellow wash that they have, uh, mainly because I wanted to see how it looked and I didn't want to buy another paint. <laughs> I didn't want to go out and buy uh, the yellow glaze, Lamenter's yellow. Uh, but I have to say, it looks absolutely great. It it really does dull down. I shouldn't say it dulls down. It really brightens up the Null Oil and Caraberg Crimson layers, but they are still very visible. You can tell there's shade differences, so I think it, it does a great job. Fundamentally, it does the same thing. It just kind of deepens the... It darkens the color towards the, the cracks and crevices, like the, like the wash-style paints often do. But on the whole, I'm very excited with the way they're turning out. Uh, they're one of those things where, like, I, my, my goal with this army, frankly, is to bang them out really quickly. Um, they're not going to be, uh, you know, our best painted winners at all. Um, I, I paint well. I, I do a lot of work. But I'm not interested in, in winning hobby awards. So there are mistakes. There are probably need to be tightened up with the flesh. And those are all things that I can go back later and do. And I'm perfectly content with that. Like I said, I'm not trying to win anything. Um, I just like having fully painted armies. It's I only play with fully painted armies anymore. I just as a personal rule. And uh, the, yeah, it just kind of continues in that trend. So uh, what I have on the table right now in front of me as I'm talking and doing all this, I have five, I have my five um, Hearthguard Berserkers, the guys with, I use the, um, the chain flail ones, basically, I forgot the actual name of the weapon, but you, whenever you hit something, you roll a die, and on a three up, it does a mortal wound in addition. So when you get a bunch of these dudes, and there's actually a formation called Lord of the Lodge that lets them pile in and attack twice, uh, theoretically, you got a lot of mortal wounds flying around. So they have that unit. I have five of the Orc Hearthguard, which are the guys carrying the, the flame pole axe guys who shoot magma, and it slows beasts down and, and does all kinds of nasty things. Uh, five of those... And I have a Rune Master, who is the least used hero in the in the game, but he is part of that formation I was talking about, so that's that's why he's here. And next to him is uh, a Doom Seeker, which was a model available from Silver Tower that uh, Jack over at Rerolling Ones uh, was kind enough uh, to to let me buy off him, uh, just because uh, I wanted it. And you know, I'm one of those guys that if I'm going to go into an army, I might as well have all the options available. Uh, they actually have not op updated the, what is it, the uh, Age of Sigmar app to show me his uh, War Scroll Battalion. So I don't actually know what he does, to be perfectly honest with you. I imagine he's very similar to the Berserker in terms of he's just a one-man wrecking crew. Um, but to what extent, I'm not even sure yet. But you know what? He looks cool. And um, this army really lends itself to batch painting. So might as well throw him in the batch with everyone else. And that is really it for Hobby Progress. I really haven't bought anything since the last time I was on. Uh, most of my purchases, I'm kind of in a holding pattern right now, like a lot of folks are, where, um, I, I, like I said, my May Army is 
uh, chaos, but I wanted to do strictly an undivided army. Uh, and the Slaves to Darkness stuff has been largely underwhelming So in terms of rules and, and, and playability, which I've talked about before, so I won't go into that now. But what I'm doing is, is really saving that money, holding off till I get an undivided book, which people are rumoring about all the time, that there's going to be a Dark Oath is kind of the term that gets thrown around because of the Dark Oath War Queen uh, being one of the Malign Portance characters that came out. And the other factions have gotten their releases, meaning the, the Night Haunt guy got his whole faction. The Lord Ordinator was an indicator of uh, the other chamber opening up for Stormcast. And so the logic goes that there's going to be Moon Clan Grotz and uh, a Chaos Undivided. This is going to hurt me particularly because I do also have <laughs> uh, like 200 Moon Clan Grotz sitting in a closet right now that are completely unpainted. Um, I'm not going to touch those even a little bit simply because I really want to see where the faction goes before I invest anymore. It it was kind of a, a random buy just simply because some guy was like, Hey, uh, I'm looking for this old forge world book and I had it and I didn't want it anymore. I was taking up space. We're trying to downsize here at the Greeks household. And it's like, Hey, what do you have for it? Um, when I say downsize space, I mean specifically our bookshelf. Uh, my wife and I both read quite a bit. And so um, he had just a whole bunch of grots, and I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll take a whole bunch of grots off your hand, thinking maybe one day there'll be an army for them. Uh, but, you know, they're they're so old. It's the old Battle for Skull Pass model, so if they do come out with a full new faction, I, I may just try to get rid of them on eBay and, and buy into a new thing if I really want that. Really, I got them because I was like, I, I personally think that destruction is underrepresented and wanted to have a destruction army at some point. But I really think, like I said, we're so close to seeing if they get a new release. I might as well just hold off and paint something that's a little bit newer, a little more exciting at this moment. So, yeah, that's basically it for hobby progress. So we're going to move into uh, games played really quick. Nothing, simply because I only played, or only recorded like two days ago. Uh, and in that game, I talked about my uh, game against Jack's Corn. And I actually had a lot of positive feedback about that on the, the YouTube uh, upload of this same podcast. Or that same podcast, I should say. Uh, and just folks talking about their experiences with various uh, summoning mechanics. I haven't heard anyone from the, the Zinch end talk about their thoughts. But there was one Slanesh guy who said it was absolutely bonkers that he's able to summon two uh, Keeper of Secrets a game pretty reliably. Which is nuts if accurate. Because those guys are... Those guys are insane. <laughs> so, I mean, but that could, there's a lot of factors involved that could be, you know, that gentleman's meta. Maybe he cracked the code on, on Slanesh and just none of us have caught up to him yet. Uh, you know, again, a lot of things possible. Uh, I'm excited to hear that someone says they're having a lot of success with Slanesh. Uh, I think it's a shame that they're, they, they boasted about one of the saddest models in all of the GW range. Um, I know they're going to get a new Keeper of Secrets pretty soon. You can't look at the lineup of, of uh, the Bloodthirster, the Lord of Change, the Great Unclean One, and then look at the Keeper of Secrets and not be a little embarrassed if you're a GW employee. But, you know, they're going to get there. They're going to get there. It takes time. You know, things don't happen overnight. And uh, I really hope they give Slanesh the release it deserves. But that was his comment regarding uh, the... The summoning abilities, and uh, generally, just kind of recap, I think they're great. I had no problems with the the free, uh, quote-unquote free, because there is a resource paid, but uh, things that, that Jack brought down. And we're going to be tackling some of those things, going in a little more detail, because I know that someone asked a question that, because of my experiences with Jack, uh, I can actually answer in an intelligent way, which is a new thing for me. <laughs> so let's see here. Uh, moving into news and releases, I have the page pulled up for what's coming out this weekend. Uh, in the Age of Sigmar side, and there's quite a bit. Really, they're wrapping up, not even, not even close to wrapping up, but they're diving headlong into the follow-up releases to uh, Soul Wars, the box set. You have, the for the Night Haunt side, there's the Dreadblade Harrows, which is a very elite cavalry unit. So you got two dudes uh, riding ghostly steeds who look like they're busting out of hell. And then you also have a named guy, uh, Rykenor the Grimhaler, who... Is basically riding an undead Pegasus, uh, if you can imagine that—a winged horse, uh, but it's obviously all skeletal and ethereal and things like that. Great-looking models. Uh, you know, I was honestly very tempted by the Night Haunt stuff simply because 
with the Fire Slayers, the whole point of them was to get a quickly painted army, uh, something I could just dive right into, get it done, and something that wouldn't distract me from my chaos, um, but would give me a chance to explore some new color schemes. The thing about the Nihon is I couldn't settle on a, a paint scheme that really stood out to me as being uh, as bold and different as the Fire Slayers were. Again, they're a side project meant to be different from my Night Haunt, from my, haunt, from my Chaos. And all the schemes that I really liked for Night Haunt are very dark and, uh, you know, they have that same contrast of dark colors and white, which is, of course, exactly what my Chaos is. Sorry, there's a police siren in the background. But yeah, I just couldn't find a scheme that really stood out to me that was, that was very different from uh, what I was doing with Chaos. There are some, but I'm just not, a, not the biggest fan of painting an entire army of them. You know, you'll see some cool stuff on like Pinterest or, or Instagram of really unique schemes that people are doing that aren't just kind of a dark with a contrast of white. Uh, but none of them said to me that I wanted to paint an entire army of them. So, yeah, I passed on that. But these models are looking pretty great. Uh, also coming out is, let me see if I can pronounce this right. Uh, for the Stormcast side, you have the Celestar Ballista coming out, which is the uh, War Machine uh, finger jigger. You also have the uh, Dracoline riding Lord Arcanum, who is a leader riding. They call him a Dracoline. It's like a kind of looks like an angry pit bull mixed with a Dracoth. Uh, pretty cool stuff. I like that model. Um, I actually like. I gotta say, the the Stormcast releases uh, really have me wanting eventually to revisit the army, and and the reason for that is if you don't know, I actually had some Stormcast. I had Hollowed Knights, and I got rid of them. Uh, and I can talk about why in a little bit, but really the fundamental thing is the original sculpts that we had when the game first came out, they were so bland. Everything was so static, and I think they were trying to convey the feeling of like the stoic stalwart, you know, never runs, just stands there and takes the attrition, that kind of stuff. But what you got in the end was some very, very static poses. It's actually one of the reasons I never, uh, I'll never buy an extremist chamber thing is because I think the poses of the beasts that they're riding don't scream aggression not motion and you read the stories where they're like plowing straight along into things and just eating people up it's like eh, it doesn't look the same it doesn't feel like that and so that's kind of why they lost me on the stormcast uh, and then of course right when i sold them off they came out with a bunch of incredibly cool sculpts for the the vanguard wing who all look amazing um, and the palador riders just look absolutely sick which uh, if i am going to go back to stormcast at some point i'm going to do a a lore-based Astral Templars army and focus on the, the Vanguard wing stuff because uh, Astral Templars are very like, bestial, about f kind of feral, kind of like if you're if you're from 40k and you're getting into the game. They're the Space Wolves of Storm Hosts, if you catch my meaning. That kind of feral aggression, all about hunting pride and things like that. Uh, so yeah, anyway, uh, Stormcast releases the guy on, what's it called? The Drac Dracoline and the Celestar Ballista. Also coming out is another named character for the Night Haunt, which is Kurdos Valentian, uh, the Craven King, who is a super baller looking guy. Uh, he's sitting on a throne with a trumpeteer and a flag bearer next to him. Uh, I'm curious to see if people have trouble with that base. Basically, he's like his whole little throne is coming off a little swirl, ethereal swirl. I know folks from the Star Collecting, sorry, the the Soul Wars box. Uh, I hear mixed reviews. Some people who got earlier these copies were complaining that things are so fiddly and they're going to break and you have trouble. And then everyone else who I've talked to in person holding the model says that's not going to be a problem. So I don't know. I haven't actually built them for myself. I, I did the uh, the giveaway to get rid of the, the both halves of that, uh, which they're in the mail. If you're listening to the awesome winners who won that giveaway, everything's in the mail. It'll take a bit to get there. In addition, the... Evoctors for Stormcast is the, I believe this is the one that's a unit of, of uh, wizards, if I'm not mistaken, and then also a knight in Cantor. So, yeah. Uh, the bigger news coming out, those are like the specific units. The bigger things that are coming out, really, the all-stars are the starter sets coming out. Of course, there is Soul Wars, the giant starter set, but in addition to that, there's also numerous smaller sets to get people in the game. Uh, Jess, who was on the channel for a little bit at one point, has expressed interest in playing AOS. And so she has a keen eye for the Night Haunt stuff. And so when you look at these, it's basically the Soul Wars box set. You take out the core book and some of the heroes and you get this. Kind of like they did with uh, the two-player starter set for the original one. And then they broke it down into Thunder and Blood 
and something else where they kind of got progressively smaller but still had some base models to get you started uh, really it's just you know what can you learn the game with what are the core mechanics you need to actually learn the game and that's what these sets are perfect for and if you bought soul wars and you're looking for where to expand picking up the 80 dollars set that has um, really just more of each side is a great way to go and so i think I, that's definitely something i would check out uh last thing they're really coming out with is the basically the old starter set the corn bloodbound and stormcast eternal sets uh, they're they're repackaging those and putting them into start collecting box form and i find this very interesting uh one because it's a great deal it's a screaming good deal if you want to start a a basic stormcast army uh with the sculpts that came up the first round um and you want to do a corn bloodbound for us like those are those are great models. I mean, I, like I said before, I, I wasn't crazy about the Stormcast poses. But if you're looking to get started, there's ugh, there's no, hard to find a better place to do that. Because it actually has the full thing. as the Dracoff on... Uh, uh, sorry, Lord Salsa and Dracoff. As well as Lord Relictor. Everything that came in there, it's all for you. So great places to start with army building. Um, I'm kind of curious as to how they'll fit. Because there already is a Stormcast Eternal and Corn Bloodbound Star Collecting Box. So I'm actually kind of curious if they're going to keep all of those various types of products or if they're going to replace the older ones. And honestly, I would feel no tears about that simply because the Stormcast ones are kind of odd in the sense that um, they have incomplete units. They, you know, the uh, Retributors, where the big hammer guys come in units of five, you get three in the box. Uh, that's kind of the biggest one. There's a lot more of those types of incomplete units in the Soul War set that people weren't really stoked about. Um, I'm still not quite sure why they did that, but that's a design choice they went with. And then, um, yeah, the Corn Bloodbound actually was actually a solid deal because I think, if I'm not mistaken, all those units are whole because you get five Blood Warriors, but their their minimum size unit is five. That's how you buy them. So that's kind of cool. Uh, so I think the Bloodbound one is kind of, the, frankly, the winner here. But, yeah. It does look like, though, with the corn bloodbound side, you only get 10 blood reavers instead of 20, if I'm not mistaken. 9, 10. Yeah, looks about right. As well as a whole bunch of last chance to buy. They're kind of reprinting some old stuff. So, yeah, that is it for news and releases. About those um, things that I'm not I'm not really going to buy anything, to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, at this point, I have, I have firmly glutted myself on buying... All of the uh, battle tomes and stuff that have come out for Night Hunt and Stormcast. I have so much content to produce that uh, I, I got no room in my life or my schedule for all these new things coming out. So I'm kind of glad that uh, glad glad that Kill Teams is coming out for 40k, just to kind of give me a break uh, in terms of, of digesting all this stuff. I think a lot of folks are sharing that same sentiment of it, it's kind of overload at the moment, especially if you like one or either of those armies in the, star, in the new starter set for Soul Wars. So, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to complain about that. We had a seven-month drought after KO came out, Carriage and Overlords. So I'm not going to complain. At the same time, it's like, ooh, a lot of us need to need some air. And uh, hopefully we'll pass the buck over to uh, 40K for a week or two because I really like it when they get content because I like both sides being happy. Uh, moving into listener questions happy to do that today if you have a question that you would like to send to me look in these show notes down below either on youtube or whatever podcasting apparatus you use and uh, you'll see an email it's a bitly link that leads to my website where you can leave your name and your question and i'll read it here on the air i am always looking for content no questions too dumb and you can ask about just about anything uh, just keep it try to keep it uh, roughly on topic you can ask personal questions about me uh, as long as it's you know related to the channel and, and things like that so going into my first question from m 2 All Pro, So, hey, I'm new to the hobby and am most drawn to making and painting of armies. I love the Citadel paint range, but I get all the color. Uh, but to get all the colors you realistically need is expensive. How do you recommend building up a collection of paints? That is actually a super good question. Uh, as far as how do you build up a collection of paints, you do it over time. Uh, for example, uh, I have a bunch of new colors that I've recently gotten. Uh, as I build up my collection, I certainly don't have all the Citadel paints. But for example, you pick one project at a time and you invest in that. So for me, the paints that I recently gained were the Orange Wash, 
uh, the yellow wash and Chikero orange. Why? Well, because I wanted to paint the beards that way on the fire slayers. You know, um, what I would say is if you're just getting into the hobby in general, you have no paints, no model paints from any range whatsoever. Go with whatever your army basically needs. So if you're doing Stormcast, for example, Retributor Gold and Agrax Earthshade are going to be your bread and butter. Uh, assuming that's the color scheme you want to go with. You know, fill in the blank with, if you're doing Hollow Knights, it's uh, Lead Belcher and uh, Null Oil. But, you know what I mean, get your, your minimum vial product paints out there. And then from there, pick one thing to make better and, and go back to your first models, add it. So, for example, let's say you're doing... Uh, we'll do Hallowed Knights because that's the one that I actually know. I painted those before. Uh, if you're just starting, I would say get, pick a blue that you like, a shade of blue, lead belcher, and null oil, and just go to town. That's really what they are. They're silver and then blue trim and highlights. Some gold uh, if you want to hit on those. And then the next time you get paid or you have some extra hobby funds, improve one thing about them and buy the paints for that. So if you want to do the gold trim on the shoulders now, Grab yourself some Retributor Gold or Bathazar Gold, whatever gold you like, or whatever kind of color you like, and go to town. Go back to your first models, repaint them, get that, don't repaint them completely, but add the shoulder detail. And then when you get paid again and you want to pick a special color for their tabards, go back and do that again. And then in, in doing so, you're slowly building your collection. And I guarantee you the next time you start a new army or a new painting project or you expand your army, you'll be able to start you know, get the whole model done with all the paints that you have currently available. Um, yeah, and that's kind of the only, only suggestion they can really make. It's certainly how I did it. I just basically pick one unique thing about an army and, and go out and buy paint specifically for that project. And for that, I budget probably like 25, 30 bucks. You know, that's like three or four paints, depending on the discount you get from your local store. Um, yeah, and that, that's certainly, you know, and then and there's other things you can do to save money, like uh, thinning your paints is good, obviously, for painting, but also it's a money saver because your paints go further if you thin them down really well uh, and that thing. So, yeah, just paint by project, not necessarily by uh, model. Does that make sense? Like, don't buy every single paint you need for this model specifically. But if you like, my army is generally these colors, pick those up and then improve one thing about them every time you have some extra cash. All right, next question comes from Oscar. What is the best advice for finding motivation to take on big painting projects? Well, I'm sitting here uh, looking at painting probably a 90-man army of, of naked baby dwarves who are on fire. And uh, I'll tell you kind of my secret. If you didn't see the interview I had with Mark from Rerolling Ones, uh, we talked a little bit about having painted armies. And, and really, my, my thing is I don't paint models, I paint armies. By that, I mean none of my individual models look stellar. I mean, I have some heroes that I really devote time to. But on the whole, they're all a very uh, tabletop-ready standard, not necessarily winning any awards. What I would say to someone who is not um, a, a dedicated painter, but looking to have a full, you know, a, a good-looking army for the table, um, I would say set your standard to be mine, which is my standard, if you don't know, I call it all the time, is three foot fabulous, meaning if you stand three feet away from your army, it looks fabulous. Because three feet is roughly what you'll be if you put your models on the table and then you, like, you're standing over them or taking a picture of them or something like that. That's pretty much the distance you're going for. You can obviously see a lot more problems and errors that you make when you're really up close while you're painting them, but don't worry about that. Put the model down, stand three feet back, and take a look at it. So that kind of sets your your goal when it comes to how um, detailed everything should be. So ease up on the goals a little bit. You know, like I said, paint a few that they look okay, maybe hand wavy at best, and then put them on a the table and step back three feet and they're gonna look great. Um, so setting real, that's a realistic expectation for painting in a large lot of armies or a large lot of models for an army. Uh, as far as motivation goes, I think really the key is kind of mixing up what you're painting. Uh, for example, with Fire Slayers, there's kind of less, this is probably a really bad example because there's less variety in the army. Most of the ar units are dudes holding various weapons, but for most other armies, you can mix up stuff. So if you had, uh, I always pick on Stormcast because they're kind of the most, you, you know, everyone kind of knows generally what models there are. Uh, if you have like 30 Liberators to paint, I would say, 
every once in a while, stop painting liberators and, and grab a hero or grab a Drakoth rider guy or a prosecutor that the pigeon guys with wings flying around. Just something really to break up what you've been painting. Um, and that's the thing is I don't think most people, most people who, who, who seriously set their mind to saying, I want to paint an army. I don't think they really mind painting um, a lot of models. I don't think it's a numerical problem. I think it becomes a problem when they paint the same model a bajillion times, which is why, frankly, Skaven players and uh, Grot players who have fully painted armies, I think that's why they kind of stand at a, at a different level of being very impressive. Like, they are awesome because that guy painted 90 Grots, <laughs> and he knows he's going to spend more time pulling Grots off the table than he's going to be playing with them. Because that's, that's what Grotz do. Um, you know what I mean? So you can have respect for those things. At the same time, for everyone else who's not playing a Horde army, you really do have the the chance to, to kind of spice up what you're painting. So I would say, in terms of actual advice, make a plan. So I'm going to say, I'm going to paint 20 Volkite Berserkers, and then I'm going to paint my Magma Droth. Because it's something different, it's big, it's cool, it's bold looking. Uh, it uses a very different color palette because it's a beast versus just a dude with flesh. Uh, and that's that's kind of my, my treat, if you will. Reward yourself. Uh, I would also say it's important to note that rewarding yourself with painting a special model or doing something fun doesn't have to be from the same faction. For example, uh, in addition to Fire Slayers, I also have some random models that I want to paint. Like, I don't need a spawn from a Chaos Army. Uh, I'm actually good on spawns. But it's something different. I get to use some fun colors. That's my treat for painting uh, a bunch of Volkites and, and these guys. Uh, hearth guard berserkers so that kind of stuff that kind of thinking where it's like um, making sure you don't burn yourself out by painting the same thing over and over and over again is really the key to success as well as um, my last point here which is really um, get your process down right paint your test model for how you want your your scheme to be i'm assuming you already have a color scheme picked out whether it's one from the book or a custom one that you already decided on and then find ways to make that as efficient as possible. So like my current efficiency model for my Fire Slayers um, is starting, usually it's starting from the lowest point of the model and going outward, so flesh, because nothing's underneath their flesh. And then from flesh, I go to the tabards and the belts. And from that, I go to the armor and weapons, because those are kind of the next thing out logically. And then I go to the beard and the mohawk, because that is the absolute top of the model, right? No, nothing's on top of those. It's the most forward-facing um, what I would say in terms of efficiency, let's say you're doing, let's go back to our Hallowed Knights we've been picking on. Uh, if you're doing Hallowed Knights, what you would do, obviously, is hose them down with lead belcher. <laughs> I say hose them down, uh, brush them down if you're, if you're doing everything by hand. Um, and then, right, have your, have whatever your efficiency structure is for that. It might be, um, the blue on the shoulder pads get the blue cleaned up and then go back and do the gold trim on the shoulder pads. Okay. Get that all cleaned up. You know what I mean? Um, really just kind of hammering down your process this way. And kind of the dual thing is one, you can batch paint very quickly when you do that. Um, that way you can do, you can grab 10 liberators cause you're doing all the same process for all of them. Really crank them out faster than you might think. And then the bigger thing is, is that you can actually walk away from your project if you need to step outside or your wife calls you or whatever, uh, step away and come back and know exactly where you are because your process is similar for all units involved. And so that makes it very, very quick to stop and pick it right back up. And that's kind of really for me specifically where a lot of the value in doing paint processes and batch painting is, is that I can put things down and pick it right back up you know, without missing a beat. Uh, so I hope those things help you, Oscar. If you have any more clarifying questions, please feel free to write in. Next question comes from Andrew Henderson. Hi, Doug. Do we know anything about the fate of Argentine after the All Gates battle? Did Dracothian kill him? And if not, do you think we'll ever see him again? Well, I sure hope so. Um, I say hope so. Uh, he did not kill him. I hope we see him again, to clarify that. Uh, we know that he sped away, um, kind of nursing his wounds. Um, I'm not sure if the injury that Dracothian dealt him um, woke him up from that trance. If you're not familiar with what we're talking about, at the end of the Rumgate War series for an, a battle for an Allgate, Archeon had under his control one of the god beasts named Argentine, who was corrupted by Zinch. 
And uh, this god beast was fought by another one named Dracothian, who is the king of all dragons, who is a good guy, fights for order. And um, basically they got into a huge god beast brawl and Dracoth had him running away. So, and that's kind of where the story ended. We haven't really touched on God's be- God Beasts narratively since then, which I'm not quite sure how I feel about that. On one hand, it, it's great because uh, it lets kind of more relatable heroes be the center stage. At the same time, like, man, they introduce these really cool creatures that are out there and then really haven't done much with them. That's kind of a shame. Um, so do I think we'll ever see him again? I really do hope so, but I want it to be a meaningful appearance. I don't want it to just be like a throwback, like, and then Argentina appears from nowhere. You know what I mean? Because then it's like it's like WWE, right? You know, fights going on all of a sudden. It's like, yeah, then the Undertaker comes. Um, so yeah, I, I want it to be a meaningful appearance, not just like, and we talked about this guy before, and he's here. You know, that's all I really have to say about that one. Uh, Dan Unsworth asks, "Hi, Doug. Uh, hope you're good. Massive fan of your content. Thank you very much." Uh, it really helps me convert. It really helped me convert my friend into playing Age of Sigmar. Awesome. Uh, my question for you is: Do you think Games Workshop will expand on the existing armies next, or introduce new ones? Uh, reading the Malign Portents has got me wanting to collect free guild things like a cog for it would be awesome. But it'd be nice to see new models, either male or female. Uh, well, Dan, I, I don't know for sure. To be honest with you, I don't have any inside knowledge. But uh, my opinion of the matter. Um, I think, if I'm not mistaken, the ones that we, we kind of know, or at least have an educated guess on the horizon, would be uh, Slanesh, MoonClan Grotz, and an Undivided Chaos of some kind. Uh, we also know, as far as things that exist, there's going to be uh, a new versions of Light and Dark Elves. Not as we know them now, but um, basically the souls that uh, Malarian and Tyrion took. Uh, to make their respective races. So those are the kind of the things that have been alluded to so far in the books that we haven't seen in model format. Uh, as far as which one of them is going to get done first, I have no idea. Um, my gut tells me either Undivided or um, Moonclan Grotz, just to kind of keep up the ongoing narrative and the the, the profit people being released. Um, what I'd like to see, frankly... Free Guild is high on my list of things that I want to see. And, and the reason is, I think that, as I said in my, my actual Free Guild lore video, I think that there's a lot of power in having a very relatable perspective. We can't relate to Stormcast, even though they're the main guys. Kind of the same thing with Space Marines and 40k. Like, they're the main quintessential figure of all like the product lines and stories, but we don't relate to them, right? We relate to the Imperial Guardsmen. We relate to the Free Guild, who's just an ordinary mortal trying to do what they do to survive. And so I think they're a very important, integral part of the narrative for us as readers. And I think that's really awesome. I really hope that that Games Workshop is seeing that in terms of book sales, because books like City of Secrets uh, are really, really the reads that I point people to because of that exact reason. Because, hey, here's a character you can wrap your head around in a setting that is pretty firm. Um, And so really, I hope, I mean, in terms of my advice for you, just start buying Free Guild. Really, I mean it. Uh, they're they're awesome. Uh, in terms of uh, rules and allegiance abilities and things like that, I'm going to tell you right now, as I told my friends at Rerolling Ones, they're my absolute favorite. I don't think any other uh, General's Handbook faction does allegiance abilities quite like them. I think they're, they really took the feel of the army from before and, and just kind of doubled down on it. It is super unique uh, and I think extremely cool sounding. If you're not familiar, the uh, Free Guild basically can form companies and they can do like overlapping fire for each other. And if one guy gets charged, another guy can shoot that enemy for free and out of phase and that kind of stuff. Just really kind of manipulating, um, making your opponent regret charging your stuff is, is a super powerful thing. So uh, anytime you can do that, I'm, I'm all about it. Uh, so I, I mean, I would encourage you, frankly... Go buy some free guild. If you like the way they look, be ready for it when it does drop. And I, I know it will drop because there's so much support uh, for that faction and there's so many cool things in it. Uh, so, Dan, thank you for writing in. Next up is Alex. So I picked up Soul Wars for the painting and I wanted to create my own paint scheme. White, purple, red, and copper. But I do want them to use the rules for one... Okay, so you're talking about Stormcast. I want them to use for rules for one of the Stormcast chambers 
So how could I explain this narratively? I know it doesn't really matter, but uh, I want a good story to back their affiliation uh, with their written chamber. And, but they have totally different armor. Uh, well, they do have uh, kind of a, a mechanism for this. If you read, they haven't really dived into it too much in the books. Uh, I haven't looked too closely at the newest incarnation of their uh, battle tome yet. But um, in the original Gates of Azir book, a uh, cool thing happened where uh, Bandit's Hammerhand, who leads the Hammers of Sigmar, which is the probably most prominent uh, Stormcast Stormhost, uh, met up with a detachment. Basically, what it is is different chambers can have different schemes even with the, within the same army. Um, so, for example, he met up with a Lions of Sigmar uh, detachment with, a, with another guy leading those forces, and um, they look very, very similar, like extremely similar. So it almost seems like they're a derivative of each other. Um, kind of like how if you're if you're a 40k guy, um, the ultramarines can can be broken down into other uh, chapters. Kind of not explain that very well, but basically they kind of spread their units over multiple places, give them different names, just kind of identify them uh, easier. But um, yeah, I, I think it totally makes sense. You don't need to stretch it very much. I mean, you can honestly. Some of the easiest things you can do is those older storm hosts, uh, as it has been written about, have been sent back to train uh, later reforgings. So even if you just did something like, you know, say you wanted to do Hammers of Sigmar rules uh, using your own paint scheme, I would frankly just say, yeah, they sent uh, several uh, Lord Relictors and, and Lord Celestins back from the Hammers of Sigmar back to the Anvil Apotheosis, and they're training the next generation of reforgings. And so I was trained by those leaders and therefore I would follow their tactics and their instruction. I think it's narrative. Uh, there are many foundings, I would think is the word, of storm hosts since the Age of Sigmar has begun as Sigmar is continuously producing them. And those guys are being taught by people who are already seasoned veterans. And so it makes sense that they would be coming back and teaching what is effectively the next generation of warriors uh, that enter the battlefield. So I don't I mean... Honestly, I don't think you have to stretch too far uh, to have good reasons for pretty much whatever you want. But I'm also that kind of guy who just says play whatever you like. Um, where you get into some weird territory for folks is like if you bring a clearly painted army of one, like, you know, it's clearly Hammers of Sigmar, but you just want to use, you know, Hallowed Knights rules or something like that. Uh, other than that, I don't think anyone really uh, raised any issue with that. So the next question comes from Alex again. Um, also, if you did go with Seraphon, how... Oh, you're, so in the last video I said that it was a debate between Fire Slayers and Seraphon. If you did go with Seraphon, how would you have painted them and or what are some cool paint schemes you have in mind for them? A minor traditional light and dark blue with purple dry brush over all of it. That sounds cool. Uh, the beasts are red and orange and it looks awesome. That does sound awesome. As far as what I would do, I think purple would kind of be my main color wheel color palette, whatever you want to call that. Um, just because I like painting purple. I think it's a fun color to paint. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I really love really the, the, the picture that makes me want to play Seraphon is the one where it is the Stegosaurus. I don't know what it is. Like the big armor plated guy on his back. Um, and he, he's purple and has like the kind of multicolored plates going along his spine. I think that guy just looks super cool. Um, and so that's kind of what I'd, so I'd probably go for. Something similar to that. Um, yeah. I probably wouldn't deviate too far from what the the kind of studio scheme is. Because I find it so striking. It's one of those ones where it's like, I'm not usually sold on the studio scheme. That's an army where I totally am. Um and then the last question comes from Clancy Murphy. It says, hey, Doug, I'm kind of stuck on where to go next in terms of purchases for my Bloodbound and was hoping you could help. I have Scarbrand, Mighty Lord of Corn, a Blood Scrater, Exalted Deathbringer, two Blood Stokers, two Korgraths. Uh, and then for infantry, I have 65 Blood Reavers, 13 Blood Warriors, and I'm probably going to buy two Star Collecting Bloodbound boxes to get two Slaughter Priests and 20 more Blood Warriors and six Mighty Skull Crushers. Any tips on anything else? Well, okay. Well, you have a colossal, <laughs> colossal corn army here. Um, as far as tips for you, I'm going to tell you this. 
uh, the Gore Pilgrim's Battalion is insanity. Okay. Uh, this is the one that I played against Jack with uh, last week, and I'll go into some more detail about what it was forcing me to do. So I just had a normal uh, Magakin army. I wasn't specializing or trying to really abuse any particular mechanic. And uh, with the Gore Pilgrim, it extends the range of the Blood Secretor banner, which makes you re-roll successful casting attempts on spells for your enemies. And there's so many heroes that can unbind. So what you get when you mix all that together is... Um, I would cast a try to cast an endless spell. I would succeed and re-roll the success. And if I succeeded again on the off chance, because some of those things are pretty high casting values, he would unbind it with a hero, and it would be nuts. Um, and then you could also use blood tithe points to unbind it. So as far as what I would suggest you buy, quite frankly, demons. You can't summon Scarbrand uh, with blood tithe points, to my knowledge. If I'm wrong, please correct me in the show notes or, or comments below. Uh, as far as what to buy, honestly, if you bought, a, you know, if you really wanted to go for core and stuff, I would say pass on at least one of these Stark Lightning boxes for Bloodbound. Grab a Demon's one and then um, do your Gore Pilgrims and run a bunch of minimum units. And you're going to be summoning things left and right because the Slaughter Priests have a prayer that they can use where they damage a nearby unit and then gain a Blood Tithe point, which is bonkers, by the way. Uh Jack had three Slaughter Priests, I think, and was just, like, plinking wounds off each other and then other units nearby, and then they would fail Battleshock tests. It would just be bananas. I uh, absolutely loved it. So I do suggest that. You have all the makings of the most effective kind of corn, uh, sorry, Blades of Corn army, except for the fact that you're not taking advantage of any of the summoning stuff. Even if you held off, you know, let's say you wanted to play a game, you know, proxy just for trying it. Just proxy Scarbrand as a bloodthirster of corn and see how quickly you can summon him because I guarantee you he's going to be there faster than you would imagine. Uh, you'll be able to rack up blood type points with the kind of stuff you have. If you took, frankly, minimum squads of most things, you're, you're going to be putting some hurt on someone and then doing a lot of late game attrition by summoning stuff back in. Uh, so I would say definitely really, really flex the muscle there. If you're at the point where you can buy that much stuff, Looking at demons to be able to use in completion the mechanics that you have available to you is really going to go a long way. Um, so that's my suggestion. Look at demons. Again, I'm not the biggest uh, demon player. Like I had a bunch of zinch stuff before, um, but I like what they've done so far with the the new rules and the summing and things like that. And so it's seeming to be really cool stuff. And, and you know, like I said before. I ne it never felt unfair. It never felt one-sided with the corn stuff. Um, it's just they have a lot of cool things available to them, and you should take advantage of every single one of them uh, because they're fun. They're legitimately fun. I know Jack had a good time, and I had a good time playing them. Uh, so, yeah, don't don't let those rules go to waste. You know, that's what makes an army unique and flavorful. Certainly as a Chaos army, um, unique and flavorful is what they're all about. So that concludes my listener questions. Like I said, if you have a question you want to get on the show, go ahead and leave it. Uh, follow the link in the description or comments down below, and uh, you'll be able to leave a question for me. It goes directly to my email, and I pull it up right before every single show. Moving into kind of my main topic for the day, I wanted to talk about my plans for the Fire Slayers in a little more detail, simply because... Uh, uh, a lot of questions came in about asking me, this is through mostly uh, Facebook Messenger, people can message me directly if you want to do that, asking me, like, why would you start this army when they're in such a weird place uh, in terms of they have no real spell casting abilities to be able to get those malign sorcery stuff off, and they also really uh, are hurting in terms of dispel ability. And this, this question kind of came along as a two-prong one, also talking about uh, carriage and overlords as well, which is an interesting army. They're there. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't really understand KO as a faction. And by that, I simply mean, I feel like I could just stare at their war scrolls all day and, and none of it clicks to make sense to me. Like how, how they effectively do uh, the shooting. I'm not talking about like their effectiveness. I don't think they're a bad army at all. I just, I, you know, those, there's, everybody has those factions where you can just stare at it all day. And like, I don't, I don't get what they're trying to do. <laughs> and it, it makes me feel really dumb uh, when I do so. Sorry, I'm just getting a brush here. I didn't mean to make any sound. Um, 
But the question was raised, like, you know, why would you start an army that doesn't really participate in magic and, and spell casting right now at a time when really that seems to be the focus? And what I would say is a few things. Um, is it really the focus of the game or is it just the focus of uh, options right now? Because, for example, you know, people say, oh, it's the magic edition. Well, because they came out with a cool bunch of cool magic rules and then they released malign sorcery. You know what I mean? Which is a very magic-centered thing. And and I, I get it, why people feel like the game has swung in favor of magic, but I don't necessarily agree. For example, like the corn army I was just talking about shut me down hard in, in, in the magic phase. I did not operate as my army was intended simply because I couldn't get any spells off. Um, and what that told me as a player was I was too reliant on something because I perceived it to be kind of a sure thing. And it simply isn't. It's spell casting simply is not a sure thing. There are some units that can do it really well. Like a Lord of Change always could and probably always will be able to spell cast pretty much whatever they want. And I'm okay with that. That's their thing. But your average wizard honestly isn't doing a whole lot. Most wizards only get one attempt to spell cast anyway. So it's like, eh, I think the perception is, is greater than the reality. Um, in terms of specifically endless spells, why would you start an army? Uh, I think it's important to note that when they released the endless spell stuff, they also, that in that same book, came a whole bunch of ways to stop it. For example... Uh, I'm, I'm so bad at remembering all the names because I've been reading so many of them, but there is an artifact in the Realm of Life that allows you to dispel as if you were a wizard. And I talked about this briefly that I'm probably going to go that route. Uh, and, and I do absolutely love that one. It's something that I'm very interested in using, which is just like, you know, I mean, having more chances to unbind spells is is massive, I think. And I'm curious to see when the FAQ drops how they're going to handle... Um, the the malign sorcery stuff when it comes to units that can't normally unbind so if you're not familiar like take for instance jack's corn army um when the malign sorcery spell is cast right they're trying to summon a, an endless spell uh, jack gets an attempt to unbind because his corn stuff can unbind as if it were a wizard right and later on in the game um if Normally how it goes, if you wanted to stop an already existing endless spell, you could, instead of casting a normal spell, take a chance to unbind it. Okay? That's huge because what it means is it infers that you had to have an ability to try and cast a spell that you are giving up in order to take rid or get rid of the endless spell. And the reason I'm explaining this is because I get actually quite a few questions about this. Uh, so what that means is for armies who don't have magic but can unbind, like Jack's corn. Uh, he can never get rid of an endless spell once it's already been brought to the table because he can't sacrifice a spell casting attempt to try that. Does that make sense? So that, it's kind of a weird position to be in. Um, so he gets one shot when it's attempted to summon for the first time, but after that, it's either there or it's not. And there is no in between. Um, so that, I think that needs to be addressed for some of these armies to really thrive. Cause it's one of those things where it's like for fire slayers, um, if they do like an umbral spell portal and it summons there, it's, it's a tough place to get out of if you don't have something to unbind. Now, obviously they have great allies. You can obviously do a stormcast dude, um, to try who's a wizard. You can also do, um, the rune Lord from dispossessed, which I think is more thematic, um, who, who's really great at actually unbinding stuff. Uh, but a lot of those things, you know, that they can't cast magic, they're kind of falling into that same problem. So I'm curious to see. We have a big FU, FAQ coming up, um, how they address some of those things. I know, I mean, I'm going to be super frank here. Games Workshop tries to make money. They're a business. That's what they should do. And so when a new and frankly lovely product line at the carriage and overlords is being decried as terrible so much uh, as long as they have the data to back it up like literally seeing games and not just listening to internet rage they actually have to see it so someone has to try it and then fail repeatedly and let them see it um they're going to adjust the rules and, and kind of put them in a more favorable light and that's just the way it is you know what i mean uh, and the, the realities of that you know, they're they're good for people who have invested in that product. 
Um, so as far as like the the argument that Ko and Fire Slayers are at a disadvantage because they don't have as many unbinding and, and spell abilities, uh, I don't I don't see it as much. To be perfectly honest with you, I, I feel like uh, I don't know. Even with the list that I was building for Chaos, I feel like it's still pretty on par. The stuff that I can get for their artifacts and the artifacts that came with the Malign Sorcery expansion. Uh, they're about the same to the number of unbinding attempts that I would get if I was trying with my Chaos Army, which has a wizard or two in it, depending on what I'm running that particular day. So, yeah, uh, that doesn't uh, phase me in the slightest. Uh, as far as Carriage and Overlords, like, they're just generally where they are at in the game. Uh, wh- one thing that uh, Brent from Rerolling Ones had said in our group chat, if you don't know, he has some Carriage and Overlords, uh, they're just not painted, that's why they're not on the channel. But um, his his thinking was, if they had an ability to fall back and still shoot, they they pretty much be golden. Uh, not necessarily tournament winning, but super effective because shooting is what they want to do. Uh, so even if one of the um, I don't know what they call them temples, skyports. Um, I think it's skyports is their kind of city equivalent. Uh, could fall back and shoot, that would go a long way to helping them out. And I, I think that's probably on the money. Everything about them seems to be revolved around shooting from their stat line and then all of their allegiance stuff, a lot of it anyway, uh, buffs people in melee, which is kind of a fun combination. Um, but it's not a combination that really translates well to the tabletop from the experiences that I've seen online. Again, um, I haven't actually played as them, so I take that with a grain of salt. It's hard, though, because you'll see some battle reports, and then, like, I'll look at the rules for units later, and I notice, you know, it's just some very um, honest mistakes that they made, but it skews it skews your ability to be able to accurately judge how an army is doing if, like, you know, they lost or they won. It's like, well, the list was illegal. Like, well, it's, it's kind of hard to judge when, when your, your frame of reference is, is kind of tilted a little bit, so... I understand uh, Games Workshop having some trouble trying to correctly assess what the actual problem is. As far as uh, me and my personal, uh, what I plan on doing with my Fire Slayers, um, I'm going to, I mean, they were already decided to be set in all of life before that expansion came out. I I actually decided it the weekend before. And so um, it was just kind of dumb luck that they got chosen for Garan, which is where that artifact comes from. And so I'm going to be taking that on one of my heroes. That actually is a legitimate question. If you know the answer to this, I would love to see it in the comments down below. Uh, Do you know if you had uh, an army that could take more than one artifact, like you had a battalion that allowed you to, can you take an artifact from your faction and then a different artifact from Malign Sorcery? Because there's actually been some debate about that. And I haven't really seen a clear-cut answer. And I'm hoping that comes out in the FAQ uh, frankly, I would love it to be you could take one from each, you know, because you're you're both. You're you could be a fire slayer, and have access to those things. But you're if you're from somewhere, why wouldn't you have access to the things you're from? So that I mean, you know what I mean. Each each one of us is has traits, and then it's also some from Blaze. Why can't these guys? And plus, I think it would just frankly, they would sell more books that way. <laughs> you know what I mean? That I think they want their. Uh, their hardworking material, trying to make them money uh, in every possible way. And I think that makes sense from a product perspective, but also just a, a gameplay and narrative one as well. And it would go a long way for like more combinations for uh, some of the smaller factions, or, or factions are in a weird place, so they could take a Grand Alliance, um, not a Grand Alliance item, but you know what I mean, like the uh, faction item. And then also uh, a location one. I think that'd be pretty sweet. Pretty tight, if you will. Um, Moving into uh, units that are armies that have less, I would say, options to them. So focusing on carriage and overlords, like shooting is their thing, right? Um, they, They have some combat units and some of them are pretty good, but they're hard to get into position. Uh, I'm thinking specifically of the balloon riders. Uh, I think yeah, eventually we'll see definitely an uptake in those. There was a, a lot of, you know, there's a lot of negativity about carriage and overlords, and I know they're in a, raw, in a rough place until the FAQ comes out because they were 
people say they were hit with a nerf bat. Um, I think it's one of those situations. I don't want to ever describe a situation as being a nerf bat because it, it almost makes it seem like the company doesn't care. And I think that's that's very untrue. I think they put a lot of work into Carriage and Overlords and probably hate seeing people deride them online. I think what is probably more accurate is to say that the game has evolved around them. Um, the same thing happened, frankly, with Sisters of Battle from 40k. Uh, for the longest time, not necessarily this edition because all their rules got reworked at once, but uh, in previous editions, the Sisters of Battle were in a really rough place, and it wasn't because they were bad. When they were released, they were amazing, and then a new edition came out, and the game evolved around them. It's exactly what's happening here. Where I don't, like I said, I don't think that KO are a bad army at all, by any means. I think that they're a great army. I think they're, frankly, beautiful and well-supported in terms of model lines, and they have a lot of options available to them. I just think, you know, uh, I think the game has evolved to a point where it's like, it's not about malign sorcery, it's about when you're engaged in combat, you can only shoot the person in front of you, which I think is a fantastic rule, uh, but I think that for a shooting army, we, we can make some concessions that are like, you know what I mean? Like like Brent's exact idea, fall back and shoot. That's perfect. You know what I mean? It, it really does uh, address the issue while still keeping them um, on the same rules plane as everyone else, right? They still can't shoot anyone they're not engaged with, which is awesome. They just get an ability to try and, and repurpose that and, and put it in a different way, right? Pick their targets, that kind of thing. And I think that's super great. Uh, so, Game Jar, if you're listening, send your check to Brent. <laughs> He's a cool guy. He's a cool guy. Uh, yeah, and so, uh, yeah, I really kind of double down my point. Having a game evolve around you is not nearly as bad as being, like, unsupported. And, and that's how people make it sound. Game Workshop is no longer really supporting this model line. It's like, no, they don't support Bretonians. They still support Carriage and Overlords. <laughs> um, and I think sometimes we lose sight of what that term means. And, and frankly, how it makes people feel. Um, and, and I think, above all... Everyone just enjoying their models, their hobby, whatever they're doing, I think is, is paramount. And it's certainly what I, what I teach and what I strive for. So I don't like hearing that. And again, I don't make the case that they're the greatest things ever. I don't try to like play it up to make it sound like, oh, no, they're much better than people give them credit for. I don't know. I don't play the army. What I do know is that uh, no one should feel dumb or bad for buying in the models that they really found cool. So I'm just finishing up here. I'm doing the... Uh, last little bits of a cape for a rune master. He's got some weird nooks and crannies in this dude. Where it's like you really can't get the brush in uh, where it needs to go to get this layer down. I'm um, doing, like I said, they're all in realm of life, so a lot of greens for the cowls and the capes and the tabers and all that kind of stuff. I'm really liking the hearth guard units way more than the Volkite berserkers. I think I'm going to have a very uh, elite type army because of that okay so uh next topic i want to talk about is wild guesses speculations and hopes and dreams for a dark oath book people have been asking about this what i what i want out of a dark oath book as someone who is all about undivided chaos what do i wish this book would bring to me a uh, few things i think would go a long way if they want to stick with the theme of what slaves to darkness is currently which is your leaders project an aura that gives certain buffs to various uh, units based on what their mark is. You know, kind of mark of Nurgle leader will give a buff to a mark of Nurgle unit nearby. If they want to stick with that, I think it's great. What I would like to see is some kind of overall mechanic that does the same thing, right, by, by picking a, a unit and uh, really buffing it in a different way. My main problem with the army right now is that it's so redundant. I have a lot of ways to get reroll ones of anything, but nothing to like give me rend, nothing, very little few things to do mortal wounds, um, spells are limited, prayers, that kind of stuff. So for example, if you had a mechanic that was like, turn one, uh, Slanesh is ascendant. By this I mean um, everyone gets plus one of their moves, Slanesh units get two. I'm just making this up on the fly. But something that says, um, you know, everyone gets a little bonus, but hey, if it's your mark, it's your time to shine, right? And so you can have all your Slanesh units just bolt forward in the front. And obviously your leaders are doing the same thing. They're giving a, a buff to things that have a similar mark. 
Uh, so it could be slash one, uh, sl turn one slash, blah, 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 sorry, turn one slash units move faster, uh, all units move faster, slash units move an extra two inches faster. And then, hey, your Chaos Lord on night, if anyone uh, around him is slash named, he can run and charge. You know what I mean? Just like super aggressive in your face things. And then turn two is Nurgle is now ascendant. So everyone gets free roll ones to wound. And hey, if you're a Nurgle unit, you can reroll all failed wounds. So now that unit is super good. Um, you know what I mean? And I, I think that would be super legit if if there was something like that where not only like take the same mechanic really where you're kind of doing buffs to things around you based on uh, whatever whoever they're worshiping, and bring it to the next level by saying magnifying it now if you're familiar with slaves to darkness really what i just described is all the prayers coming from the war shrine the war shrine does the same thing you can cast that you're gonna pray to a certain god on behalf of another unit they get usually it's re-rolling ones of blank and hey if they have that same mark so if you do on a corn unit and you're praying to corn uh they get to re-roll all failed hit rolls right just a magnified version of that that's exactly what i just described the problem with the shrine, though, is not right now it's redundancy, but what I would love is a full prayer list for him so he's doing other things. He's got other stuff going on. So imagine if you did that where... Um, let's do, let's do a, a quick and easy one. Uh, Nurgle, his thing across all these units is re-roll wound rolls of one. Right now, as it is, um, if you have a Chaos Lord who gives his allegiance ability... To that unit, they can reroll wound rolls of one. If you have the War Shrine, and he pray and he's marked as Nurgle, he can give reroll wound rolls of one to any unit. But hey, if he does that on a uh, an actual Nurgle unit, they get to reroll all failed wound rolls. Okay, so what you can do is keep the Shrine having those kinds of abilities, right? But now it matters because say it's the Slanesh turn and everyone else is being running and aggressive, he can still pass out that reroll all wound rolls to a Nurgle unit nearby. So like, it just adds depth and dimension. All of a sudden those things mean anything. Uh, all the units have something every turn making them good. And one of the Chaos Gods being Ascendant is really good. Really, really good. Uh, and what that does is it really frees you up to expand different ways of army it, it really rewards you for mixing your forces which i think is the whole point of undivided is having a, a conglomeration of chaos stuff not just one and that's kind of what i see it as where like right now if you're not doing slanesh you're not gaining any benefits because slanesh is the only thing that isn't redundant there's a way to make them run in charge there's a way to wake them uh get an extra attack on sixes to hit you know those kinds of things nothing rewards you for mixing up your forces so I think having the um, the different gods be ascendant each turn would be a super cool mechanic. Uh, a prayer list for war shrines and maybe even a priest type model would go a long way. Um, big things would be if you had a prayer that was like, "Hey, pick a unit, uh, increase their rend by one." Right? It doesn't sound it sounds too good to be true, um, but the thing is, is that Slaves of Darkness has a ton of attacks. But none of them have war end. Like the knights don't unless they're on a charge and they have glaives. Um, really only the, he he the leaders do. And so it's just not enough. There's not enough punch. So if you could say, hey, pick one unit and do that, it tips. It gives them options without being, I think, too much. And so I think that would be huge. Uh, so let's see. The, the big turn thing of which God's Ascendant. Uh, the prayers would be a huge thing. Also, obviously, a spell lore. Everybody gets a spell lore. It looks like if a Dark Oath book do does come out. Uh, they're going to have unique endless spells, which, you know, are the ones that are currently we've seen for Night Haunt and Stormcast. They're either really, really good or they're kind of meh. You know what I mean? Uh, and that's fine. You know, uh, I don't really have any uh, specific ones that I'm looking for, to be honest with you. I just want stuff that's flavorful. Uh, what I would love is something that allows for either a current wizard they have available to them to be able to cast two spells or... Uh, a new unit that can cast two spells. And the reason I say that is I have seen multiple second edition games and, and wizards are great, but a wizard who can cast two spells is amazing. <laughs> um, if you haven't seen the game on rerolling ones where I took my slaves to darkness versus Mark's uh, bone splitters, he had a Wurgog prophet teleport across the board because of a Gurian specific spell, which is not broken at all. It's a super good spell. It's just, um, 
I think, I think it's very well powered. Teleported and then shot a Grave Tide endless spell directly at my leader and took him out. It was amazing. Uh, really great game. You should watch that one. Uh, but uh, that showed me, like, man, if you have more than one spell and you can really throw some of these things out there, like, you can really get stuff moving, especially first turn when no one's in range to unbind you. That's awesome. Uh, as far as anything else goes, just the normal stuff. I just want some cool battalions. Uh, that really mixes it up. Currently, if you look at the Slaves of Darkness, which is kind of where I'm drawing a lot of my inspiration from, and it could be that Dark Oath is completely different, but the closest analogy we have right now is Slaves of Darkness. Uh, what I want to see is um, none of the battalions right now actually include Marauders, which I find very interesting. It piques my interest. Uh, right now I have 40 painted Marauders, but I'm holding off on the rest to see what they do with them. Uh, if they keep them around or not. I think we're past the point of them deleting model lines. You know what I mean? I don't think they would drop Marauders from their catalog. Uh, but I'm curious to see where they go with them. Um, I've really definitely focused more on Chaos Warriors, which are more like a, a Liberator equivalent, which I really enjoyed. Um, just because they stay around more. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised if they did not include marauders in a lot of things and the reason simply is, is because they're so cheap they kind of plug in and do well everywhere so i wouldn't want i don't want a situation where like marauders are best here and so people just buy a ton of dudes for that reason you know i i don't know i like the warriors i, I tend to stick with those guys and um i think that's it for the most part honestly i don't think they need a ton of new models i'll be i'll be honest it, it looks if the trend follows that whatever malign portents prophet or whatever we're calling them um comes out with their unique faction so far the lord ordinator and the night haunt dude have both represented huge new model lines i don't think that slaves to darkness if that's kind of the main army they're drawing from really needs a lot they just need options within those units and that's what we're lacking i would like it if there was sort of a, a middle ground unit between because right now it goes uh, marauders chaos warriors and knights is kind of your progression of strength and wounds and things like that i do wish there was some unit that was a little bit heftier maybe like i don't know maybe like a remodeled version of chosen where it's like a five-man unit very elite probably has a 40 mil base um you know it's like, kind of like a, a retributor equivalent for stormcast something with a big old hammer that can do some rend and just deliver the hurt I think they definitely need some kind of heavy unit like that. Uh, but that's honestly, I mean, that's really most of what it is. Everything else can be, all the other gaps that I see it from a an army perspective can really be filled in with simple things like prayers and allegiance ability that matters. And, um, and that's really about it. And spells, obviously spells. So yeah, I don't know. Tell me your thoughts, what you would like to see out of a Dark Oath book. But this is me throwing mine out there. I would love it if uh, your first four turns were like the different chaos gods being ascendant. And those gave minor buffs to everyone, but major buffs to units that had their specific allegiance or, or keyword or whatever. Um, I would also, just as an aside, love it if ever chosen was added as one of those keywords. You know, as an optional one this way, if you want to take uh, Archeon and be completely chaos divided undivided but against chaos like the chaos gods like not bowing to any of them that would be legit but then also dark oath seems to be from what we know of the war queen story a little bit the bits that we have she is subservient to all of them right the whole point of chaos undivided is you worship them as a pantheon archeon's thing is that he doesn't worship anyone he just takes the best things from all of them as an offering right he elevates himself Whereas the things we've seen with the Dark Oath War Queen, she submits herself to all four equally, which is different. It's a, it's a very different mindset uh, that I think it warrants its own book. I think Dark Oath should be its own thing versus Ever Chosen, but I think Slaves of Darkness should be able to become Ever Chosen units. So, I don't know. We'll, we'll see what they do. Those are my thoughts. I'd love to hear what your thoughts are. And, uh, and that's pretty much it for this episode. I'm uh, just over an hour, and so a uh, voice is running out. I had a lot of fun today. Friends, you know, I, I do want to do a bunch more videos. I'm going to really crank out some work this weekend. 
I do tr want to try to get back to doing the five videos a week. Thing is, it is exhausting. And right now I'm going to be launching a Patreon campaign to try and get some more uh, fundraising. And the reason to be very clear and honest with you, I have a fantastic job that allows me, that is going to allow me to work four days a week. But to make up the income that I'm going to lose on that fifth day, I would love it if Patreon supporters could pitch in. Uh, that's actually what my current goal is. So if anyone can like pitch into that, it makes up the income from that fifth day. And then I will work for you on the fifth day of the week. Every Friday, I'll just devote to creating, recording, and producing content for the week. So I can have five videos a week, as well as one podcast a week, and, and have a great time doing all of it. All of it. So I'm very excited for that prospect uh, that's going to be coming to you. If you do have questions, like I said, Follow the link in the description down below to head over to the question and answers page, and I'll answer them on the next show. Until then, friends, I uh, hope you enjoy your wargaming. If you're a KO player, God bless you. It's a lot of fun, and uh, stay uh, hydrated out there. It's getting hot around the country, and I will talk to you in my next podcast. Thank you all so much for listening, and happy wargaming.